Hi, everybody. I hope that you're doing well. I'm Pastor Chris Grant from St. Peter Lutheran Church in Warwick, New York, and I'm excited to share another uh, sermon with you today. We're in a sermon series right now called Breaking Through the Chaos, Discovering Order in the Disarray. The series focuses on the disorder that we all experience personally and that we're witnessing right now in our communities, and especially what God has to say about it. At some point of your life, you may have heard someone say that they wish that they could go back to a time when life was so much simpler. Life can feel complicated. It can feel complex. It can feel confusing. Our series guiding verse comes from 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Or in the NIV, it says, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. In part one, we looked at God the creator, who created order from chaos and who brings us order to our chaos today. If you missed that message, uh, you can link below in the description. You can see it on YouTube. For this second part of the series, we will be looking at the Old Testament reading on the church calendar for this week, which is 1 Samuel 3, 1 to 10. So to get this to get us going, I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, nearly 15 years ago, before we were married, Robin and I took a trip to the Adirondacks in upstate New York with some friends from church to do some whitewater rafting. Now, although it was a summer day, the weather wasn't necessarily what we had hoped for. It was cooler. It was probably in the low 70s, overcast, and it was raining on and off. The water temperature was also somewhere in the low 70s. Now, given the weather conditions, the low 70s felt a little bit cold. Now, for us, this is about as much of a wilderness experience as we would go, as people like us would take part in, because we're not, Robin and I, we're not really uh, wilderness people. Uh, Robin and I started joking about how even on this summer day, we were getting cold as we were rafting. And she actually started to shiver. And after a little time passed, she started to really shiver, like violently shiver. Our tour guide on the raft, the leader, who was like a 17-year-old boy, he started to get concerned. She actually started to uh, have experiences of symptoms of, of hypothermia. We needed to get her back to safety and then cover her with blankets and get her warmed up again. I must say... Robin has the distinction for me of being the only person I've ever heard of to get hypothermia in 70 degree weather. But being separated from society on that raft in the wilderness actually made the situation a little bit scary. She was curled up on the raft and our tour guide is giving instructions on how to keep her warm until we could get back to civilization. But Robin is a fighter. She was able to survive the 70 degree temperatures like a champ. Now, that was kind of our wilderness experience, whitewater rafting in a mostly controlled environment. Some people actually like to go out into the real wilderness. The Adirondacks in 70 degree weather is not the wilderness. But you've probably heard of stories where people go out into the real wilderness and then things go wrong. They get cut off from the trail and get lost or an unexpected storm comes in and they get stuck, stuck and they have to hunker down in place. Or they come across an animal that they weren't prepared to encounter. Being in the actual wilderness can be a really challenging situation, and it can bring out a lot of a range of emotions as you realize that you're in the wilderness. You could feel lonely or alienated as you're separated from what you're used to. You could feel, feel fearful as you're facing dangers that maybe you're not prepared to face. You could feel hopeless. Will you ever get out of this situation? You could feel vulnerable as you've lost control of your life. See, the controlled wilderness experiences like whitewater rafting or even the more risky ones that people do can be a lot of fun. But when you're in an actual wilderness where you have lost control and don't know how you will get back, that can be really scary. See, that's what it feels like when you're in the actual wilderness in the outdoors. But there's other kinds of wilderness experiences. Maybe you've heard of something like the financial wilderness. How am I going to get out of my financial situation? Maybe you've been in a relational wilderness with your spouse, or your kids, or your friends. How am I going to fix this relationship? You feel lost in the relationship and you don't know how it will ever get fixed. The professional wilderness. Will I ever get a job that I like? And one of the worst kinds of wilderness realities is the spiritual wilderness. The times when you start wondering, God, where are you? Are you there? Can you hear me? Do you hate me? This is one of the worst places to find yourself, feeling separated and isolated from God. 
In part two of the series, Breaking Through the Chaos, we are going to look at the disorder and disarray that comes in the spiritual wilderness. That is the situation that we see at the start of our reading today in 1 Samuel 3. The Old Testament people of Israel, God's people, were in the spiritual wilderness. It starts, 1 Samuel 3, starting at verse 1, says, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. So what was going on at the time of 1 Samuel 3? Why was the word of the Lord rare? Why were there not many visions? Why were they in the spiritual wilderness? Well, let's take a quick look at the history of where we are in the history of Israel, and it'll, it'll probably make some sense. So Moses leads the people out of Egypt triumphantly. God claims them as his people and gives them the Ten Commandments. God provides for the people in, in, the, in the desert, guiding them and providing actively, giving them the food that they need in the form of manna. And then the next generation, Joshua leads Israel into the promised land and conquers the kingdoms that were there. And then over the next several hundred years, things start to break down into chaos, spiritual chaos. Israel fails to keep God's commands and ends up being invaded time and time again. And each time that God rescues them, they end up turning away and getting invaded again. There had just been, at the time of Samuel, there had just been a civil war in Israel as 11 tribes of Israel declared war on the tribe of Benjamin. And in this civil war, most of the Benjamite men were killed. You can see why this might have led to a spiritual wilderness. As we see the last verse in the, in the book of Judges, which is the book that leads right into 1 Samuel, the last verse of that book says, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. And that sounds like chaos. And as we move into 1 Samuel, the high priest, the high priest, Eli, allowed his sons to do all kinds of wicked things in God's house. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. This was the spiritual wilderness for Israel. What started out triumphantly, walking out of Egypt and capturing the promised land, had degenerated into a mess. Everyone did as they saw fit, fighting and violence among the people. The word of the Lord was rare. I'm sure many people in Israel wondered, God, where are you? Are you there? Can you hear me? Have you ever looked around and felt that same way? You experienced the deafening silence of God, the deafening silence. You see chaos in your communities or in our country. And you wonder, God, where are you? Are you there? Or maybe you see the way that our culture has shifted and degenerated. And you wonder, what's going on? You see the breakdown in race relations. You think, God, this is not what's, how it's supposed to be. Are you there? Are you listening? Or maybe you see the way that the family has broken down. Divorces, broken families, discord among family members, both in person and even on social media, you see a breakdown in family relations. And then maybe you look at the church. You see the sizes of churches shrinking, or you see some bad teaching, the declining influence of the church. Maybe you felt that way in your own church or in your ministry or in your own life. The deafening silence of God. God, are you there? Can you hear me? Do you love me? Maybe you felt like you've been at some point in the spiritual wilderness. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. And then we pick it up in verse 2 as God breaks through the chaos as he enters into the wilderness experience of his people. It says, One night Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. So now we've made it most of the way through the narrative here. And at this point in the narrative, God has called Samuel three times. And each time Samuel did not recognize him. How interesting. Here is Samuel studying and ministering under the high priest in Israel. And yet it says, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. 
So apparently you can be serving God's people in a position of influence and not actually know God. And finally, it was Eli, the high priest, who caught on, picking up in verse 8. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your, Lord, for your servant is listening. Into the wilderness, God called out to Samuel, and Samuel finally heard him. When we are in the wilderness ourselves, the spiritual wilderness, we might see our problems and not recognize the word of God calling out to us. In our own chaos and the complexity of our lives, are we listening for the call of God? Is he speaking to us and we don't pay attention or recognize it? Sometimes we get so used to hearing and experiencing the chaos that's got, that God's call to us is lost, hidden from our ears. Perhaps the problem is not that we have been abandoned in the wilderness, but that we are not listening for the voice who can lead us out. Are you listening for the voice that can lead you out? Do you recognize it? I read a story of a Native American and his friend who were walking through Times Square in Midtown New York during lunch hour. Unlike today in a pandemic, the streets were actually filled with people. Cars were honking their horns, taxi cabs were squealing around corners, sirens were wailing, and the sound of the city was the sounds of the city were almost deafening. Suddenly the Native American said, I hear a cricket. His friend said, What? You must be crazy. You couldn't possibly hear a cricket in all this noise. No, I'm sure of it, the Native American said. I hear a cricket. That is crazy, his friend insisted. The Native American listened carefully for a moment and then walked across the street to a big cement planter filled with shrubs. He looked under the branches and sure enough, he found a small cricket. His friend was utterly amazed. That's incredible, his friend said. You must have superhuman ears. No, the Native American said. My ears are no different from yours. It all depends on what you're listening for. But that can't be, said the friend. I could never hear a cricket in this noise. Yes, that's true, came the reply. It depends on what, it's, of what is really important to you. Here, let me show you. So the Native American reached into his pocket, pulled out a few coins, and discreetly dropped them on the sidewalk. Then with the noise of the crowded street still blaring in their ears, they noticed every head within 20 feet turned and looked to see if the money that had tinkled on the pavement was theirs. See what I mean, asked the Native American. It all depends on what you are listening for. See, Samuel did not know what he was listening for. He heard a voice and he didn't know who it was. What happens when God calls us? Do we ignore it? Do we not recognize it? Do we hear it and then reject it? Is it a word that we don't want to hear? So maybe we either reject it or pretend like it wasn't God who was speaking it to us. Maybe we never even pick up his word to hear what he might be saying to us. And then we find ourselves in the spiritual wilderness asking, where are you, God? And then we might look to God, look for God in better life circumstances. Well, how am I going to know if I ever hear God? Well, let me look at my life circumstances. And that's a mistake. Maybe we think we'll feel God's presence if our relationships get better, or if we get that promotion that we're looking for, or if our health or the health of a loved one improves, or maybe we're even insisting on something miraculous from God in order for us to think that he actually cares or that he actually is speaking to us. If one of those things happen, then I will know that God loves me and he has not abandoned me in the chaos. See, that type of thinking will leave you in the wilderness, not hearing God's call. It will be difficult to see God's presence or feel his comfort if we are looking for him in the wrong places. Maybe you're in that position right now, the spiritual wilderness, stuck in the chaos. And that's where the story of Samuel tells us good news as God breaks through the chaos. See, the first three times, God's voice seemed distant to Samuel. So much so that Samuel actually went all the way to Eli's room and said, Eli, you called me. But the final time, it says something a little different. I don't know if you caught it. It says, the Lord came and stood there. The Lord came and stood there and called him by name, Samuel, Samuel. See, the Lord didn't just call Samuel in the wilderness. He came to him. And that's good news. He came to Samuel and called him by name, Samuel, Samuel. And that's good news for us, too. See, when God called Samuel, the Israelites didn't know where, when, or how God would show up. Had he abandoned them because of all the misdeeds that their country had committed? 
The word of the Lord was rare in those days, but it's much clearer to us now. Now we know for sure that he showed up, that God showed up, that he came down to us in our wilderness. He went through the wilderness of rejection and broken relationship as his closest companion, Peter, denied him three times. He went through the, th the physical desire of the wilderness as he cried out, I'm thirsty from the cross. He went through the wilderness of loneliness, crying out, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And he died. And then he rose again so that we no longer need to fear the spiritual wilderness. He came to us 2,000 years ago to call us out of the spiritual wilderness, to break through the chaos. And just like Samuel, he calls us by name. See, when you were baptized, you weren't just called child or person. You were called by name. I baptize you, Daniel. I baptize you, Jessica. You were baptized out of the wilderness of sin and death and called into the kingdom of eternal life. And he still comes to us today in his word and in his body and his blood at the altar. The Lord came and stood there by Samuel. And he comes to us still today to break through the chaos, to save us, to encourage us, and call us out of the spiritual wilderness. He gives us comfort through our times of wilderness. See, at the beginning of the sermon, I, a message I talked about what it's like to be in the wilderness. And God calls us out of that place spiritually. When you're in the wilderness, you feel, as I mentioned, lonely and alienated. Well, God calls us from loneliness and alienation to being reconciled with him. From being fearful to being loved. From being hopeless to an eternal hope. From feeling vulnerable to feeling trusted. To feeling that we have somebody that we can trust on, trust in and rely on. From feeling like we're not in control to being placed under the care of the mighty creator who loved you enough to die in your place and call you by name, by name, as his child. He called us out of the wilderness. He calls us by name. And in response, all we need to do is listen to his call. Speak, for your servant is listening. Amen. I just pray that this, this realization that, that God has not abandoned us in the spiritual wilderness, but he still comes to us, would be real to you today and would minister to your spirit. Amen.